Now to give a memorial for this uh, outstanding a colleague of ours that has passed away, I'll ask Dr. Richard Wu, who is a professor of medicine at UT Southwestern, to please come forward and uh, say a few words about Owen. Thank you. Uh, I've been asked to speak in uh, Dr. Obell's place, uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, Manos and Subash for inviting me to this lecture. So go forward is this button. Point it up. Okay. Okay, I have no disclosures. Okay, so uh, I had the privilege of uh, initially meeting Owen back in uh, 2004. At that time, I was uh, a faculty member at the University of Oklahoma. And he had just uh, moved down to Dallas as the director and, and came up to uh, visit the lab. Uh, Sonny Jackman was doing procedures at that time. He's, he was the former chief of EP there. And the first time I meet Owen, he's, uh, uh, what, how to put it, uh, uniquely dressed. So walks into the lab. Uh, he's wearing a black leather cap, a scarf, a camel hair jacket, plaid pants, and cowboy boots. So this is unique. Uh, okay, he could still be from Texas. Um, and the first time you hear him speak, he's got this very distinguished uh, English accent. Um, it sounds colonial British, so I couldn't quite place it. And I made the mistake of asking him if he was Australian. <laughs> and he looks at me, uh, somewhat disgusted, and he says, man, can't you tell? I'm African. So uh, that's, that's one of the distinguishing characteristics. He, he was uh, from South Africa, and um, he was the son of a physician. His uh, father is a, a very well prominent, well-known uh, cardiologist there, and I think he was probably the first electrophysiologist practicing in South Africa. Uh, Owen had initially started out uh, as a internist, uh, but at some point he decided to follow his father's footsteps and. Uh, go to uh, London, England, and study under uh, a very well-known uh, cardiologist, uh, John Cam. And he spent six years there um, at working initially as a research associate and then uh, doing uh, his uh, cardiology fellowship. There he also met his wife, and uh, you can see, uh, even though he started in 1996, it took him 15 years for him to finish up his thesis and, and get a uh, MD degree from uh, the University of London. He uh, did training in uh, Boston and uh, afterwards uh, did a lot of work with both uh, Jeremy Ruskin and uh, Vivek Reddy, uh, particularly in one of his interests was uh, uh, VT ablation. Uh, he was the director of the, the Dallas VA for over 10 years and uh, most importantly he was also our director of education. He uh, trained uh, over 20 uh, practicing electrophysiologists all have uh, gone on to do uh, very well and uh, much, uh, many of them credit him for teaching them how to uh, read electrograms. His other interest, of course, uh, is music. And if you knew Owen well, um, for example, if you rode in a car with him, he would pop in a CD and ask you to basically uh, critique the song. And uh, the first time he did that with me, it sounded something like either country music, folk music, or uh, a mix of REM. But uh, afterwards, he told me that uh, he had uh, written the songs. And uh, believe it or not, he's uh, uh, put out, uh, he's written, uh, recorded, and uh, produced at least five albums. You can actually download these from uh, both Amazon and uh, watch some of the uh, music videos that he's produced on YouTube. So on Sundays, he would often call us uh, you know, the day before the conference and ask us, what are you talking about? Sundays was his day to uh, prepare slides. So in his memory, I'm going to present some of his slides from a talk that he gave us to uh, uh, the electrophysiologists in our, our uh, uh, teaching conferences. So how often do you go up to a, a patient, or how often does a patient come into a clinic and ask you, uh, 
what's, what are these symptoms that I'm feeling? And, um, the, and how often do you go up and tell a patient, well, you have a plethora of PVCs, you need an ablation. What, what does that mean? What is a plethora? So um, PVCs can be due to um, either structural heart disease or uh, occur in a normal heart. They can be symptomatic or they can be asymptomatic. Uh, as we said, they can occur in a normal heart, but at some point, uh, PVCs are thought to potentially produce heart disease or produce this uh, entity known as uh, PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. And Owen liked to make his uh, words big, so you, you couldn't miss it. And uh, the most common sites of origin for PVCs uh, occur from an area known as the outflow tracts. And uh, from this anatomy slide, you can see that it's highlighted that this is on the right side. And uh, these are well described as uh, right ventricular outflow tract PVCs. They can occur in a continuum either as a non-sustained form in sustained VT, and uh, rarely uh, these PVCs are associated with sudden cardiac death. So uh, when you look at the 12 liter electrograms, the, the characteristics are generally, it has a left bundle branch block pattern and an inferior axis. So you see Q waves uh, in V1 and V2, and you see these tall R waves in leads 2, 3, and ADF, the limb leads. Uh, they can also occur in what we call the left ventricular alpha tract or the area of the aortic valve or the sinus of valve salva. Uh, they're similar, but you'll see that there's an earlier transition uh, with a, a small R wave in V1 and V2, and often you have these very tall, spiked uh, R waves in the limb leads. The first case reports of uh, PVC-induced cardiomyopathy came in 2000. Uh, this is a case report by Sumit Chu at, when he was at uh, the Mayo Clinic. In it, he described uh, a case about a 23-year-old woman who had a history of uh, palpitation and fatigue, which had gone on for about five years. Uh, the patient presented with a uh, mildly depressed ejection fraction and LV dilation, and was noted to have very frequent uh, PVCs uh, around uh, 50,000 uh, over 24 hours, and she could not tolerate uh, either heart failure drugs or antiarrhythmic drugs. So uh, she underwent a uh, electrophysiology study and she was found to have PVCs originating from the area that we had talked about, the uh, alpha tracts, and had successful ablation. She had uh, almost instant resolution of symptoms and uh, over follow-up of several months, she was known to have normalization of her ejection fraction. So this is the entity that we uh, describe as PVC-induced cardiomyopathy. So in the next few minutes, I'm just going to go over the objectives. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, uh, what's the definition, what's the association between PVCs and cardiomyopathy, identify those patients who may be at risk for developing PVC-induced cardiomyopathy, and describe an approach to evaluate and manage uh, the, the PVCs particularly with antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation. So um, it's been over 10 years, and uh, there have been quite a few case series uh, looking at whether or not frequent PVCs can uh, actually induce cardiomyopathy, and a lot of the literature comes from Japan. So in this group of patients, there are approximately 300 who had a history of PVCs of over 1,000 a day. They excluded the patients who were very symptomatic or had syncope or a low ejection fraction and chose to follow up the patients who were asymptomatic. So these patients had no structural heart disease. The average age was about 40, half are male, half are female. They did a baseline echo, cardiac MRI, and Holter and followed them over four years. What they saw was that, in particularly in the asymptomatic patients, those patients with a very high PVC burden defined as over 20,000 over 24 hours uh, approximately 5% would go on to uh, progress and develop evidence of either LV dysfunction or dilation. In a similar study, uh, a group from Japan looked at the effects of ablation uh, on um, patients who presented with these frequent PVCs, particularly from the alpha tract. Uh, 
Uh, these patients all had a PVC burden of greater than 20 percent, and uh, initially they had enlarged uh, ventricular dis dimensions, some uh, mitral regurgitation, reduced ejection fraction, and uh, mild symptoms. What they showed was that if they performed successful, successful ablation, uh, all the abnormalities of this uh, cardiomyopathy would resolve within approximately six months. So uh, highlighted in blue, you'll see that the uh, injection fraction improves, the dilation increases, and the MR decreases. So forget about the mitral clip, you just have to do a ablation, right? Uh, over the last few years, there's also been several animal models looking at uh, whether or not you can actually recreate or recapitulate this type of cardiomyopathy, um, and that's best done by implanting a pacemaker and then intentionally programming the device to actually deliver uh, these uh, extra systoles or uh, premature beats uh, following a sinus beat. So uh, on the top, you'll see that there's a, a comparison between, sorry, let me go back. Uh, a, a control animal with a uh, implanted pacemaker and then one uh, that was uh, implanted with uh, a pacemaker to produce by Gemini. On the graph on the right, you'll see that uh, the, the dogs that had received a pacemaker uh, without any programmed PVCs uh, retained a normal ejection fraction. For those that had PVCs programmed in, you'll see that in a matter of two weeks to a month, uh, these uh, dogs develop uh, a cardiomyopathy with a reduced ejection fraction. Afterwards, if the PVCs uh, are turned off or the pacemakers reprogrammed back to normal, uh, the heart function recovers. Here's an example of a dog that has a, a pacemaker that's implanted, and uh, on the right, you'll see that it's programmed in a way such that it's delivering premature atrial beats. So when you deliver premature atrial beats, you still have normal activation of the ventricle. So with the red, uh, the septum on the left, you'll see that the uh, wavefront, or at least the uh, contractility on echo, uh, follows uh, basically a uh, normal pattern, okay? If you could please click on the middle image, please. This is an example of a dog which has a similar pacemaker that's programmed to deliver uh, a premature beat simulating a PVC uh, at a different time. And uh, basically the investigators uh, moved around the pacemaker pacing sites in different locations. But what you can see here is that the activation in the middle is quite different from that uh, normal activation. And at a time when the septum is contracting, uh, the uh, uh, other wall is uh, relaxing and vice versa, okay? So uh, just by doing these late couple PVCs, you can create uh, dyssynchrony and re reduce uh, the ejection fraction. So what are the risk factors for PVC-induced uh, cardiomyopathy? It's, as we mentioned, it's, it's now uh, established that a very high PVC burden of uh, between uh, greater than 10 to 25 percent increases the likelihood of developing a, a cardiomyopathy. Uh, there are various studies looking at uh, coupling intervals. Uh, actually, what you'll see is that PVC cardiomyopathy is not due to tachycardia. Uh, more often than not, these patients, or uh, you'll see that the uh, rate is actually somewhat slow. It's, it's due more to dyssynchrony rather than rate. The duration or the width of the QRS has been uh, associated with uh, development of cardiomyopathy. Left-sided and epicardial PVCs are a little bit more likely, multifocal male, and high uh, body mass index. Another characteristic, as, as we've discussed several times, is that uh, these patients are often asymptomatic. Uh, there's often a lack of palpitation, so they don't seek treatment. So this PVC cardiomyopathy doesn't develop over a short period of time. It actually develops over 5 to 10 or maybe even 15 years. Uh, the diagnosis is made by excluding other forms of cardiomyopathy. So, uh, Basically, you do want to exclude that the patient has coronary artery disease. We uh, generally perform either echo or MRI to exclude uh, a primary cardiomyopathy. Uh, when doing the evaluation, you uh, would like to try to obtain 12-lead ECGs to look at the morphology, uh, perform a halter to quantify the burden. Uh, 
And next, you want to try to suppress the, the uh, PVCs and, and patients who are, uh, particularly those who are symptomatic or have some evidence of uh, worsening cardiomyopathy, such as a, a very high burden. Uh, here we have um, a study from uh, Mayo Clinic retrospective looking at uh, the efficacy of uh, drugs. And uh, what we see here is that um, in terms of uh, drugs, they work about half the time. Uh, Antiromic drugs such as, such as amiodarone and mexilatine have been quite effective, uh, but they aren't as successful as uh, ablation, uh, particularly in, in those patients who were referred to a, a tertiary care center. In general, the patients who have uh, PVCs originating from the right ventricular alpha tract are more likely to have uh, successful ablation. Uh, there have been several studies looking at the beneficial effects of catheter ablation, so there are over 15 uh, published trials. Uh, if you look at the graphs uh, on the left, they'll show that after successful ablation, there's improvement of the ejection fraction. For those patients who either just stay on drugs or fail ablation, the uh, ejection fraction remains the same. Um, on the far right, there's a graph showing a sc scatter plot. Majority of patients who do develop this cardiomyopathy do have very high burdens of greater than 24 percent. Um, there was also recently a, a multi-center outcome uh, trial for catheter ablation of uh, PVCs. Uh, in this uh, study group, uh, the mean PVC burden before ablation was approximately 20 percent. Um, the percentage of patients who were presented with uh, PVC-induced cardiomyopathy was also um, about 20 percent. The success rate overall is about 70 percent, and of uh, those patients who underwent successful ablation had improvement in, in their injection fraction. So uh, what we saw is that the patients who most likely would benefit from this were those who went through ablation for uh, the areas, uh, the outflow tracts with a, a relatively low complication rate. So uh, to summarize, I'd like to just say that uh, PVCs can induce a cardiomyopathy. It's not a just a benign condition, um, and uh, particularly when it's very frequent or incessant over, over time, many years, it, it can induce cardiomyopathy. You can try treating with antiromic drugs, but oftentimes um, if they remain symptomatic or have evidence of uh, depressed ejection fraction, they may benefit for ablation. And um, if they do come from the alpha tracts, ablation is generally successful in curing the cardiomyopathy. And to answer uh, Dr. Obell's question, what is the plethora of PVCs? Uh, those who are symptomatic, those who have a high burden, and those who are at risk. Thank you.